forward. And I believe we're recording. So uh, good evening. This is uh, I'm George Hall, and this is lecture 10 of uh, Fiscal History and Analysis. So, uh, so far in this course, Tom has uh, presented two theories of government debt. Um, in the first model, uh, the Barrow model, the government issues debt in order to smooth costly distortions from taxation. And in this theory, uh, debt is risk-free. That is, all debt must be repaid in full each period. And in the second theory, the Ariano model, the government issues debt to smooth the consumption of its citizens. This is essentially the same motivation for debt as in the Barrow model, but in this model, the government can choose whether to default or to repay. They have an, they have an option they can exercise here. And since creditors know that the government can choose to default, it's gonna charge a higher interest rate when the default risk is high. And when the default risk is low, the creditors of the government will charge a lower interest rate. Now, as uh, Tom discussed last week, Alexander Hamilton, in his report on public credit, argued that by repaying the revolutionary debt, war debt, the government could lower interest rates it faced in the future. It could establish a reputation of repaying and create a, a system of incentives where uh, it wouldn't have an incentive to default. That's a little, it's going sort of one step further, but, but that was essentially the argument. Now, what we want to do tonight in tonight's lecture is we want to think about how these two theories uh, got put into action during the first couple of decades after the American War of Independence. And in particular, we're going to focus our discussion around these two, uh, two very important secretaries of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton on the left, who we've already discussed, and Albert Gallatin, our fourth secretary of the Treasury, and one of the founders of NYU. So um, let's skip, let's get back to where we were, where we, where we, uh, where we ended two weeks ago. And we were talking about sort of contrasting sort of the Hamilton sort of federalist view of uh, the role for government and the role of debt, taxes, revenue, uh, and spending with the uh, Republican view held by Gallatin, Jefferson, Madison, and folks. So if you look at what Hamilton was arguing about with debt, he made, he made at least three sort of main points that we want to sort of highlight. In, even early on, he argued that a, that a federal debt would help sort of bind the interest of the moneyed men to, for a sort of a strong and robust uh, federal government. So he said in 1781, a national debt, if it's not excessive, will be to us a national blessing. We'll be able to, it's a political argument that would be able to develop political support for a strong and robust federal government if you've got a, a large, or if you've got a national debt that's not excessive but well-funded. In his report on public credit, um, he makes at least two points on the debt, uh, about, uh, makes at least two points, some of which we've highlighted before. One is the one that was the focus of uh, last week's um, lecture, which is that a well-funded debt lowers future in interest payments. What I mean by a well-funded debt is one that's well-supported by tax payments. And in this report on public credit, Hamilton says, for when the credit of a country is in any degree questioned, questionable, it never fails, let me minimize this, it never fails to give an extravagant pre premium in one shape or another upon all the loans it has occasion to make. So that's just basically saying, you know, if it's not, if, if, if repayment is questionable, it's gonna make, it's gonna have a high premium, high interest premium. That's exactly the model that we, we were uh, discussing last, last week. And then the third feature is, is that government bonds provide liquidity to the private sector. And in that, again, in that report on public credit, Hamilton says, it's a well-known fact that in countries in which the national debt is properly funded, being well-backed by tax revenue, 
and an object of established confidence, it answers most of the purposes of money. Transfers of stock or public credit are their equivalent to payment in specie, or in other words, stock in the principal transactions of business passes current to specie. Now, if you look at how Hamilton and Washington sort of managed the debt uh, when they were in power in the, in the 1790s, they did a mix of sort of short-term borrowing from the Bank of the United States, so the central bank of the, of the U.S. at the time. They, did, they engaged in a variety of, of uh, temporary loans in order to cover uh, short-run deficits. And then they also engaged in some long-term borrowing uh, in order to finance things like uh, building a navy and, and doing some investments into, uh, uh, you know, in sort of lo longer term investments like building a navy, establishing the Bank of the United States, for example, there. They also created what's called a sinking fund. Let me describe what a sinking fund is. So what a sinking fund is, is when the treasury commits itself to putting aside a fixed percentage of tax receipts in order to pay off the debt. It's a way of sort of it's a way of sort of signaling that we're going to use a share of the revenue that that sort of a, when we get some revenue in, the very first thing that that revenue is going to do is go and and pay down the debt or pay off the debt or to pay make interest payments on the debt. Um, it's a way of sort of trying to um, signal some credibility that that debt repayment will be a, a high priority. Um, and eventually, and they they also they refinanced the foreign debt and eventually paid that foreign debt off. It wasn't paid off until 1808, but, but they made sort of steady uh, payments on, on the federal debt. What's interesting is that despite this commitment to paying down the debt, um, one of the things about having is now that the debt was well funded, it allowed the, the, uh, the federal government a room to borrow even more money. And so actually debt rose uh, during that first decade, they, after the after the 1790 refunding, uh, they now had you know now that they'd established a credit some credibility, interest rates fell, they were they had access to credit markets, and instead of repaying the debt, they let it grow. So that would they had they had sort of increased uh, fiscal space, um, at, uh, in, in sort of modern parlance. Now. However, even though the, the quantity of the debt grew due to sort of strong economic growth, the debt to GDP ratio actually fell and was fell by more than half over this period. So, I mean, the debt grew, but, but GDP grew faster, just driving down the debt to GDP ratio. But if you look at the, the debt outstanding over this period, over this period when, so the first half of this graph, so in 1790 is the, is the refunding and the establishment of the federal government. Um, actually, that happened in 1789, but is the, is the refunding in 1790. Um, and when the Federalists, that's Washington, Adams, Hamilton, Wolcott, are in power, you'll see that the you know, debt actually grows during this period. They, they increase their spending. And then, and then in, 17, in 1800, as we see, when the Republicans are gonna enter power, that's going to fall and fall quite dramatically on there. But it, it goes up actually at first. Just sort of, yeah. The debt to GDP ratio though, whether measured by its face value or at its market value at market prices, the debt to GDP ratio falls pretty dramatically due to sort of strong and robust growth uh, in the economy and falls, and falls steadily uh, with the, uh, as we'll see, the market value of the debt rises initially under Jefferson, which is, is quite interesting. We'll, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and then it rises again during the, uh, during the War of 1812. Um, um, so that, that's sort of is Hamilton. Now, Albert Gallatin uh, comes onto the scene in... in in the 1790s, and he uh, writes the Republican answer to the report on public credit, to Hamilton's report on public credit. He writes it in 1796, his first year as after he joined the Congress as a congressman uh, from the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, 
And it's, he uh, counters, uh, writes this document. It's called a sketch, but it's really a small book. Um, it's online. You can pick it up. I, I probably should have created a link to it. Um, it's, it's not, it doesn't take long to read. Um, and he, he goes and tries to counter and makes the counter argument against Hamilton about, against, against uh, Hamilton's view on debt. The very first thing he points out is he says, he argues that debt corrupts public morals. Um, public morals aren't in any of our models. Um, they aren't, uh, but he argues that it, 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 it encourages speculation, encourages gambling, you know, behavior. And this, uh, instead, of, instead of people putting their efforts into productive activities, it, it encourages speculation. He said it also encourages mil the military establishment and, and encourages wars. And this ties into this debt smoothing argument of, uh, of debt, the role of debt to, to smooth taxes. That essentially, if, if governments have access to credit markets, they can, they can cover large expenditures relatively painlessly. Debt smooth, tax smoothing through debt reduces sort of the cost of raising large quantities of revenue quickly. And therefore, uh, Adam Smith argues, and, and, and Albert Gallatin picks up on this, it, 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 makes it, it makes it easy, they argue, that easy for governments to enter, in, enter into and finance wars. Um, and so they argue that, this, that by having access to credit markets, you know, we get more wars, uh, more military adventures, some adventures there. And then the third argument he makes is he basically takes Hamilton's political argument that of tying the, mil the moneyed men to the government and creating a, some political sport for a strong government, he, sa he says, he takes that argument and turns it on its head. He says, well, the argument really goes the other way around, that by creating debt, instead of, instead of the moneyed men supporting the government, what you have is the government supporting a favored class of moneyed men, and that it's, and the, the benefits don't, fly, don't flow from the government to the moneyed men, it's, it's that the government benefits a special, a favored financial class. And he argues this is the same thing as what the British had. And it's, you know, what we did was we just uh, established the same regime that we had under the British. And then he notes that debt rose um, during the 1790s. And he says, you know, you guys said you were going to use this new revenue to pay off the debt. And instead, you increase the debt. There's no recognition, he has no recognition in this, this sketch of anything of, that looks like a debt to GDP ratio, but he, he rails against the, you know, the increasing of debt. Finally, he goes after, in this, this uh, treaty, he goes after uh, Hamilton's decision to assume the state debts and counters that. And he says that contrary to you know, Morris and Hamilton, he said this doesn't, didn't create national unity. He said, in fact, it, he argues that it was so unfair, given that, you know, the South had paid off much of its debt, while the North had still had quite a bit of debt, standing that, you know, it, that basically with any bailout, there's always an, an issue of unfairness, that he said that this, that this experience has shown that the additional debt laid upon the Union by the assumption, so far from strengthening the government, has created more discontent and more uneasiness than any other measure. And he basically uses this sketch to call for extinguishing the debt instead of rolling it over. Instead of thinking about it, he doesn't see debt as a way of helping to uh, uh, smooth transactions. He doesn't see it as, as you know, the need for, for you know, uh, risk-free assets. He doesn't see the need for that. He says the debt should be paid off. It doesn't bind the nation together. It tears it apart. And... Uh, and sees debt also just as a, uh, he sees it also in very moral terms, uh, which is common, it, it's common today even, that we see debt uh, not just purely in economic terms, but also in moral terms. He, he says later in his life that a public debt was always an evil to be avoided whenever practical, hardly ever justifiable, except in time of war. So, in terms of revenues, now, as we've talked about, that the, these, um, uh, the, the main source of revenue in the U.S. during this period, and actually all the way up until, all the way really up until World War I, the, 
primary source of revenue in the United States is going to be tariff revenue. And back then, uh, it really, when you meant said tariff revenue, you merely meant tariff revenue on trade with the, with the United Kingdom, with Britain. It was the main source of revenue that, that was used both to fund the federal debt and to fund other, other services. Now, we had just, you know, we had just defeated the British in, you know, in the American Revolution, but we were militarily very weak compared to uh, the UK. Uh, they have an enormous navy, they, and we have, we have no navy whatsoever. And so the idea was basically with Washington and Hamilton is we should try to very much avoid antagonizing the British. Um, basically try to just to uh, go along, get along with the Brit Brits there. Um, On the other hand, Jefferson and Madison sit there and, and view very much the United Kingdom as, as, as not an ally, but, but as a foe. And they think that, and they would like to reconfigure the UK-US relationship. You know, it's always, you know, as a colony, the US was, you know, subservient to the UK. And they want to they wanna re, recalibrate that, that relationship. They argue that the, that the Britain is actually very vulnerable to the U.S. cutting off trade through a trade embargo, and they they argue that, that a trade embargo, that is, us withholding our goods and refusing to sell our goods to Britain, would hurt the U U.S. less than it would hurt the U.K. It would hurt the U.K. more than it would hurt us. Um, let's go. Actually, going back, this is a little bit working backwards. If we look at the tariff at the so. When the U.S. government gets established, one of the very first pieces of legislation uh, passed after the, uh, uh, after the adoption of the U.S. Constitution was the tariff, was, was, was getting the tariff revenue, you know, uh, was establishing a tariff, uh, legislation that established the tariff. You know, July 4th, 1789, one of the very first pieces of legislation passed by the U.S. Congress and signed by a U.S. president. And it states, it's interesting to read what it states, very first sentence is, whereas it's necessary for the support of the governor, for the discharge of the debts of the United States, so the revenue is going to go pay the debts, but the sentence goes on and says, for the encouragement and protection of manufacturers that duties be laid. So that it's, there's two components. There's one is it's going to raise revenue, and two, it's going to provide pro protectionism. Now, it's kind of, this is going to be important with tariffs being playing a key role in terms of, of revenue for the U.S. is that they're gonna, it's, tariffs play two, they play two roles. One, they raise revenue. Two, they provide protection. Now, the protection isn't evenly shared. It's manufacturers in the Northeast, uh, uh, particularly New England, that want this protection. Farmers and settlers in the South and the West don't necessarily want low tariffs because they, they don't uh, tend to produce uh, they don't compete uh, with with exports, whereas the manufacturers in the Northeast compete with British exports. With that, and there's also going to be higher rates for items brought in on foreign ships and on U.S. ships. But what's what's going to be key here is that there's going to be a political there's going to be a political constituency for high taxes. So there's going to be, and we're going to see this over the course of the next hundred years, is that there's going to be there's going to be a group uh, within the U.S., particularly U.S. manufacturers in the Northeast, that like high taxes. Um, why do they like high taxes? Because it protects their businesses. Because they need one high taxes, they're going to support high government spending, and they're going to support a robust federal government. Um, farmers and you know, uh, folks from the South and the West are going to be less keen to pay those high taxes because they don't directly benefit from them as well. So that's interesting. I think it's also just important to remember, you know, when we talk about developing countries, you know, we'll often be critical that, you know, developing countries will engage in protectionist policies. And it should be noted that when the U.S. was a developing nation, we engaged in those protectionist policies. Um, now, so, in 1795, 91% of our of government revenues was coming from tariffs, almost largely, and largely those revenues are coming from Britain. Internal revenue, uh, internal taxes are, are extremely unpopular and they're difficult to collect 
uh, you know, the taxes, taxes on whiskey generated, the, you know, ended up uh, prompting the whiskey rebellion. And despite the fact that the whiskey rebellion was crushed, it still was difficult. Not, it was never the case that a lot of revenue was ever generated by collecting taxes on whiskey. Uh, it was still a very dangerous business to go collect it, collect whiskey taxes on whiskey and other types of internal revenue. Um, and uh, not a lot of revenue was ever really generated there. So the Federalists like the idea of, of, they like tariffs for revenue and protection for some industries. The Republicans, however, want to use this trade to reshape the relationship to Europe, and particularly with Britain, and to assert US power there, as we'll see in a second. Okay, now, to kind of get, the, get a better understanding of, of how trade worked and why tariffs were such a cash cow for the United States, it's important to kind of keep in mind what's going on. So under a mercantile system, which was in place uh, back in the time, for most European colonies, they were forbidden to trade with other nations. So a colony could only train, trade with the mother country and they, could o they couldn't use foreign ships, okay? Uh, so they could only use, uh, you know, ships of, their, of the mother country or of their own colony, their own colony. Now, from 1792 to 1815, Europe's engaged in a whole series of wars. The British Navy controls the seas and France and Spain find it too dangerous to use their own ships to carry goods between their Caribbean colonies and Europe. So what the US does is they engage in something called the re-export trade or the carry trade. And let me explain what that is in a second. It's, it's useful to see a map here. So let me go to Google Maps. Let me show you the map. So if we go out here, so essentially what we have is we have these, these Caribbean colonies down here. We have Caribbean colonies down here. And we have, we have Britain, we have France, and we have Spain and other European powers. And essentially the British Navy restricts trade, is, is basically stops uh, trade coming from the Caribbean colonies to the, uh, to the mother countries. They, 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 the British Navy controls the sea and they block it. So what's the way around it? Well, the way around it is, is this. It's pretty simple. Hold on. No idea. Is pretty is what you do. Whoops, there we go. Um, well, what they're doing here, I'll just do it. Is instead of going from the Caribbean colonies to the to the mother country, what you do is uh, go the Caribbean countries to the U.S. You go. Let me see if I can do this, hold on. You go to the Caribbean colonies, well, okay, enough of this. You go to the Caribbean colonies, to the US, and then to the US, over to Europe. It's called these broken voyages. Caribbean colonies to the US, US to Europe. And in the process, what you're doing is um, uh, you're importing countries, you're importing goods from the Caribbean into the U.S. and then just turning around and re-exporting it back into the, uh, uh, back in, back, re-exporting it back over to Europe. Um, uh, Gordon Woods, Gordon Wood, in his book, um, Empire of Liberty, which is on the reading list, and you can you can get an electronic copy through the NYU library. You can get it. We should post that on the, on the Google uh, on our Google group. has a, has an excellent discussion uh, discussion of this. So you you go islands to the U.S., U.S. to Europe, and that that they argue is laid, is legal. Of course, what's interesting is is uh, so while technically that's legal, 
the British still can feel it's legal. And they argue that they, they pass a rule in, in 1756, so prior to all this, that they say trade prohibited during peace is also prohibited during war. And this instigates conflict between the US and Britain. Now, why is it that Britain gets to decide what trade is legal and what trade is illegal for the French and the Spanish colonies? Uh, what gives them the right? Well, they're the ones who control the seas. That gives them the right to do it. Uh, you know, the power gives them the right to do it. Now, both the Federalists and the Republicans want the U.S. to remain neutral in these battles, but um, the Republicans feel the U.S. is entitled to trade with belligerents without restraint or restrictions. And they argue, they use this phrase, free ships make free goods. That it's a free ship if it goes Caribbean to the U.S. That's trading, that's the U.S. trading with the Caribbean. They're allowed to do that. And if the U.S. wants to trade with, with Spain or France, they're allowed to do that too. They're not doing anything. That's not, uh, uh, that's all legal and, and able to do. And they're willing to go to war over this principle. The problem with going to war over this principle is with what army? The U.S. doesn't have an ar much of an army. The army's tiny, and we don't have a navy at all. Um, and so the Federalists in the time say, we're going to need to, if we're going to have a strong government, we need to get command the respect from its citizens and its foreign governments. We're going to need an army and a navy. And we're going to need one that's not just for defense, but also for offense. So what they do, okay, so England and France both have 200 ship navies, including dozens of those uh, ships that line. Ships of the line are, the, are the, the big massive ships that you see in those old movies. You know, any movie that shows the old British Navy in there and has those big grand ships are, those, uh, are the, called the ships of the line. In 1794, they de Congress decides to create a, create, a, um, create a navy and they're gonna do it with six frigates, not even the biggest of ships. They're gonna do it with the Constellation, and the Constitution, the United States, the President, the Congress, and the Chesapeake are gonna be the name of these six ships. The um, Constitution is still, uh, is still in the U.S. Navy. There it is. It, it sits in the Boston Harbor, and they build six of these uh, ships, it's called Ironsides, and you can, um, it's in the Charleston, uh, it's, it's uh, docked in Charleston, and you can tour it. Uh, uh, it's kind of fun to do. It's on the Freedom Trail if you come up to do it. Now, the Republicans don't want a standing army. They argue that's it's what we, we fought against, the revolution against that a standing army becomes an army of occupation. Um, and it also, an army, having an army makes you more likely to, to get yourself involved in wars. They believe very much in a citizen army and base that off sort of a second amendment type argument. They say that's why we have the second amendment. It's a well-regulated militia. That's all you need. Now it's important to note that Jefferson, Madison, Gallatin, and many of the other Republicans never actually fought in the revolution. They've actually never been in the military. So it's a little easy for them to say, oh, we'll just have a militia. What the Republicans argued is they just want a navy of small, inexpensive little gunboats to protect the shoreline. They don't think they should, we should have any ships that are seafaring vessels. Because if we've got seafaring vessels, then we might go out to sea and we might get involved in a war. But then the question is, how are you gonna back up this free ships or make free goods? And Gallatin argues, and this is an argument you still hear today, um, that, you know, pretended tax preparations, treasury preparations, and army preparations against the contingent of wars only tends to encourage wars. Uh, that, you know, if you build this army and build the preparations for, for a war, you're going to be more encouraged to use it. Uh, there was a secretary of state a few years ago who said, what's the point of having an army if you're not willing to use it? Uh, to which the generals were not too happy about the U.S. That was just a, that was during the first Clinton administration. Okay, the next thing where there was debates on expenditures, and we're gonna talk about this more next, um, in a week, is thinking about infrastructure. So let me show you what, again, let me go back to Google Maps and show you what's going on here. So if you look at the US, at the colonies at the time, let me go terrain, if you look at, at the U.S. at the time, what you'll see is, is that so most of the settlement of the U.S. is along the coastline, and it's easy to move goods along the coast. But, but there's a whole slice of these rivers and, and bays 
um, that make it difficult to, to build roads, to, to make travel, to travel on primitive roads uh, up and down, uh, north, north and south, on, along the interior. Uh, there's, so, so it's much easier to just travel uh, by ship along, along the coastline. There's also um, these mountains here, yeah, the Appalachian Mountains that, that cut across um, here that block, and what they do is they, they, make, they make any sort of river travel basically impossible, that once you, once you cross this, once you hit these mountains, the rivers become unnavigable. You start to get uh, waterfalls and, and rocks and things. And, uh, so it's very hard to transport goods from the east to the west or from the west to the east. Now what's happening in the 1790s is, um, is settlers are starting, to are starting to stream into Ohio and into Kentucky and into Tennessee and starting to, starting to set up farms and, and starting to settle this area here. Now, what George Washington and other leaders see is that we're going to have to bind these settlers to the, to the nation as a whole out here over to the east. You're going to have to try to figure out a way to, to keep, keep these together. The danger is the most, what's the easiest way to transport goods if, you're, if you are living in Ohio or in Kentucky is to take those goods and put them on a river here and send it down the Mississippi through, through Spanish-controlled uh, New Orleans or to put it on a boat here on the Great Lakes and send it um, and send it, whoops, let me just clear that, and send it up here through the Great Lakes up through French, French Canada. Um, and so you're either going to send, so what they're trying to do is figure out a way, what they've got to do is build sort of canals and roads that cut across these mountains in order to bind the nation together. George Washington's got an idea. He's got a proposal. He lives right down here on the Potomac River, and he sees that the Potomac River cuts through uh, these, uh, these mountains and connects this together, and so he's going to have some ideas about building canals out here. But he's going to need to figure out a way to pay for it. And that he doesn't have. And so they're going to need to figure out when building infrastructure, uh, who's going to pay for it? Is those state projects or are those federal projects? Okay. Okay. Gallatin's also going to later put on a, on a plan as well, which is going to be, we'll talk about that next class. Um, the third, a third area that, that the government, uh, the big debates over is over the role of central banking. One of the, so Hamilton comes out right out of the box as, as secretary of the treasury. He proposes uh, a refinancing of the debt. He uh, gets new taxes and he proposes a central bank of the United States, the bank of the United States. Uh, and in, on December 13, 1790, he proposes it. He wants to increase the money supply, make it easier for the federal government to borrow, and easier for private citizens to borrow and tax. It gets chartered in the following year and opens in, in 1791 in Philadelphia. There's also eight branches. Um, it, it's got a 20-year charter, which means the charter is going to come due in 1811. There, it's capitalized with $10 million, a fifth of which is going to come from the federal government. And fourth is which is going to come from private investors, and some of those private investors will be foreigners. Um, they'll be headquartered in Philadelphia, but there'll be eight branches. And we'll see that the capitalization creates a spike in, in 1792 expenditures in the U.S. Madison and Jefferson are going to be strongly opposed to this. They're going to argue that, that nowhere in the Constitution gives the federal government the right to charter a bank. They're going to argue that the bank does not provide long-term loans to, to agriculture, which is largely in the South and the West. It's going to give a uh, banking in the United States is going to have monopoly power, which is anti-democratic, and they're very much also opposed 
to, uh, to foreign ownership. Now, it's interesting that all of these folks are going to like central banking later on in life. And in, by, 18, by 1832, Madison and Gallatin are going to support uh, central bank. Actually, uh, right after the War of 1812, Madison will uh, agree to recharter a recharter, or will agree to a charter in the second bank of the United States. They all eventually changed their tune on that. Um, okay, so during the 1790s, the Federalists were in power. They end up self-destructing, and in the election of the 18, 1800, the Republicans take over. So there's a, a switch in power from the Federalist Party to the Republican Party. Thomas Jefferson gets elected president. Thomas Jefferson appoints Gallatin to be Secretary of Treasury and James Madison to be Secretary of State. And as uh, one of the uh, co-authors of these lectures notes, that uh, there's three great rivers in Montana uh, named after Jefferson, Madison, and Gallatin, uh, named after by, during, the, during the Lewis and Clark expedition uh, out west, which we'll note. And I guess they're, uh, they're great fly fishing rivers. Okay, one of the things that's, that's interesting to see is that one of the things that the, uh, the Jefferson administration comes in and one of the first things they do is they cut uh, military expenditures. Uh, they, it, it's quite dramatic, I'll show you in a second what, what they do, it's really is quite dramatic. Now France and Britain are at war and American shippers are doing great business with, this, uh, with these broken voyages, bringing in goods from the Caribbean, paying taxes on them and then reshipping them out to Europe. So there's a huge amount of revenue that's pouring in. Gallatin writes that this stuff is temporary, that eventually this war is gonna end and that we're gonna get out of this, uh, this broken voyage business. And so we should think about this expended, these, these revenues as temporary. We'll talk more on temporary versus permanent probably in an hour or so. So if you look at, at expenditures by type, it's really dramatic. Look at this, uh, when, when Jefferson takes over, uh, they're spending six million dollars on uh, on the military. Within two years, spending on the military goes down by two thirds, down to two million dollars, and it stays low all the way up through 1811. Note that in 1812 we're going to fight a war, and we've just spent uh, will have will have dramatically you know cut back. These are all in nominal terms not adjusted for GDP. And so you can see within 10 years, you know, uh, we've cut military expenditures dramatically and we're gonna enter a war in 1812, you know, horribly, horribly un unprepared for that. Um, but they, they cut expenditures. And you'll also note that as they're gonna pay down the debt and interest payments are gonna fall pretty steadily throughout this period. Um, if you look at expenditures over the entire period, you'll see that there's, the two, there's two spikes here. That's the, that's the chartering of the, cent, of the Bank of the United States. That's going to be the Louisiana Purchase, what we're going to see in a second. And you'll see that during the 1790s, during the first part, spending's relatively robust. However, during the Jefferson administration, 1800, you'll see, I mean, expenditures, and these are, as, as, a, as a share of GDP, falls pretty dramatically. It's, you know, there's this spike here because of the the uh, Louisiana Purchase, but in general, uh, ex expenditures fall steadily as a share of GDP uh, there. Now, what's this Louisiana Purchase? So the Louisiana Purchase, probably one of the best investments the United States has ever made. In 1800, France acquires the Louisiana Territory west of the Mississippi from Spain in a secret treaty, okay? Um, and that is what it is, but by the early 1800s, France's treasury is depleted by its war from Britain, okay? So they're in war, France is broke. North America's holding, holdings are costly to France, um, and Napoleon decides that he, that he needs to, that he can no longer afford these, these holdings in North America, and he wants to strengthen the U.S. against Britain. He doesn't want this, these lands to fall in, into British hands. It's interesting, in the U.S., at first, they think that they're just going to buy New Orleans. And they, when they, so they send um, James Monroe and Robert Livingston over to, to France to go negotiate the purchase of just the city of New Orleans. However, when they get there in 1802, they find out that France actually wants to sell the whole thing. They don't actually have authorization to buy the whole thing, but it's essentially too good a deal to pass up. They negotiate a price of $15 million 
for the uh, uh, for the Louisiana Purchase. And the Louisiana Purchase is this area. It's this area here in white. So it, it goes out. Uh, it's basically from Louisiana, Missouri, Minnesota, North Dakota, all the way to Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, Denver. It's that area there. They purchased the whole thing, kit and caboodle, for $15 million. Um, uh, it's quite, quite a deal. So how do they, how do they finance it? Um, actually, what I, I should just note that it's interesting that there's a great deal of political opposition toward this, this uh, you know, Monroe and Livingston come back uh, to the U.S. They say well, we bought the whole deal, $15 million, and there's quite a bit of political opposition to this, to buying the Louisiana Purchase. Um, and that they argue that, the, they argue that this, uh, the Constitution doesn't give the federal government um, the right to, to carry out this purchase. Nevertheless, they go through with it. It's a $15 million deal. It's off the balance sheet. It's sort of, it, just to kind of put it in comparison, all other federal expenditures that year is $8 million. So it's essentially twice of, twice the, the federal budget. Um, they're going to borrow $11.25 million at a 6% interest rate. And they're 15 year bonds. It's going to, the deal's going to be done by Barings Brothers in London, so London's gonna set it off. And here's where you really do see the payoff of the credit, you know, the, the, the payoff from the, you know, the credit worthiness earned by the policies of Hamilton and Washington. They've gotta, you know, by not defaulting, here's an opportunity where they need to re-enter foreign credit markets and they're able to do it, and they're able to do it at a competitive interest rate. 6% is the going interest rate. Back then, it's a, it's a very good rate. Uh, and they're able to borrow, you know, twice their current expenditures, twice the, you know, their annual expenditures, uh, and they're able to get a deal done. It's interesting, the paperwork for Barings used to sit in the lobby of the Baring Brothers Bank, and that bank uh, stayed in business. It was in business, you know, negotiated the Louisiana Purchase. It was business all the way up until 1995, when I don't know if you guys uh, Recall there was a there was a trader in not a trader a, a back who was a back office worker at Baring Brothers in the Singapore office. He started engaging in a bunch of unauthorized trades, uh, got way in over his heads, and ended up ban uh, bankrupting Baring Brothers. So Baring Brothers survived World War One. It survived the Napoleonic Wars. It survived World War One. It survived World War Two, but it could not survive a rogue uh, back office. Uh, employee in, in uh, Singapore. So borrows 11 point, U.S. borrows $11.25 million. They, uh, uh, the other 3.75 comes from just um, writing off some, some debts that French debtors owe to U.S. creditors. And it's sort of interesting, the vote to pass this in the House comes through on just a whisker. You know, if one person had changed their vote, it would have been a tie and wouldn't have passed. So it just barely passes and they do it. Okay, now revenue. So trade is booming in the early part of the, the Jefferson administration. And it's, it's largely the benefit of this European war and these broken voyages. So during 1801 to 1807, customs duties are more than, more than sufficient to cover all expenditures. And so the first thing they do is they, when the Republicans take control, is they eliminate internal revenue. The, the, the hated whiskey tax, that all goes. And you'll see that it's quite, it's quite dramatic. Internal revenue just basically goes from 1.5 million down almost to, you know, essentially zero, you know, $10,000. It becomes, it becomes uh, you know, trivially, trivially important um, uh, throughout this time. They, they, they systematically remove all uh, internal revenues and remove all sort of, close all the sort of shops down for, um, or all those sort of mechanisms for, uh, for, for collecting internal revenue. Um, uh, they also start selling off the West, and we'll talk a little bit more about that next, next class, next week. But re re customs revenue stays robust and remains robust as they, uh, you, know, you know, customs revenue grows, grows quite dramatically during this period. Okay. <clears throat> 
Um, the point of this graph is, so this is just the revenue as a share of GDP. And you can see the blue area, this customs revenue, is, the, is really the, the big mother load of the data. We'll explain this big drop in a second. And it's growing sort of dramatic, growing steadily as a, as a share of GDP in the, in the early 1800s. Okay. Now, Jeffersonian trade policy. Jefferson believes the U.S. should be an agricultural economy without, without manufacturing, and, but he needs free trade to sell agricultural goods abroad. Now, he's no longer, with the U.S. no longer a British colony, the problem is, is that British no longer has favored, has favored nation status with the U.K., um, and it suffers, and U.K. has no problem sort of bossing around the, the U.S. here. Um, so, but the U.S. Is really is dependent on, on Britain for commerce. But Jefferson has this idea that agriculture are necessities, whereas manufactured goods are luxuries, which may be the case. But he, he, then, he then goes and takes us a step and he says, okay, therefore, since we export agricultural goods to, the, to Britain and import manufacturing goods from Britain, we have the upper hand on Britain. They need us more than we need them. Well, so what's, he thinks we've got the upper hand. Well, the British Royal Navy begins to flex its muscles. It doesn't like this idea of broken voyages. And it starts seizing US merchant ships engaged in these broken voyages. And Britain has the, just takes it as, as a presumption that it has the right to decide what American trade is permissible and what is not. And further, they're more than happy to impress Royal Navy sailors uh, you know, sailors from on U.S. ships into the Royal Navy. And for Republicans, impressment actually really touches a nerve. And it's interesting, if you read this chapter in Gordon Wood, which I really recommend that, that you do, it's funny, even Gallatin concedes that many of the impressed were actually British citizens, but such as that. Then what happens is, is Britain, in order to combat these, these broken voyages, Britain says, um, any, Europe, any European port under French control is closed to foreign shipping unless the vessels first stop in a British port. Uh, so they gain tighter control, and it ends up coming to a head when a, when a British warship fires on one of the U.S. warships, and, and Jefferson declares British ships as enemies on that. He then turns around and he announces a trade embargo. And this has to be one of the, I don't know, if you, if you go into a ranking of stupid U.S. government policies. This is somewhere on the list. Um, okay, what this is, is the idea is, is it's going to prohibit American ships from departing U.S. ports to engage in international trade. So we're no longer allowed to export anywhere. So U.S., so it forbids any U.S. export. We're not allowed to export. We can import. Foreign ships can bring imports into the U.S., but they must leave empty. Now, this is wildly unpopular. In, in New England, and it encourages just a huge amount of smuggling and a lot of illegal activity. And then in, the Republicans double down in 1809, they, they sign a very much more draconian enforcement act. And so it's not, a, it's not a huge surprise that when you've got tariff revenue dependent on imports, if you ban exports, guess what happens to, you know, no, no ship wants to come in and, and deliver imports if it has to then turn around and leave empty and revenue plummets in 1809 and 1810, 1808 and 1809, particularly. Um, there. The embargo ends when James Madison takes office. So he, he removes the embargo and he opens up trade to all nations except Britain and France. However, you know, once a, once a ship leaves a U.S. harbor, how's the U.S. going to tell where the heck it goes? So in a sense, it opens up trade everywhere on that. We'll talk about uh, Gallatin's report on roads and canals uh, later. Let me talk about that. Now, interestingly, um, the Republicans have these large, have a large amount of revenue, and they're cutting spending dramatically. So they're running very large surpluses. And they're using those surpluses to pay down the debt. Um, and it's interesting. They, they're very much opposed to, they they don't like debt because they think it's a, a big giveaway to the money men. Um, so they want to they get this debt paid off. They think it's immoral, so they want to get it paid off. 
uh, they've got this huge benefit in that there's lots of high taxes coming in because of these broken voyages. They're slashing government spending, running these large surpluses down. And so what's happening is it's changing people's expectations about the discounted present value of future surpluses. And because of that, the market prices for treasuries debt actually rises quite dramatically early on in the in the uh, in the in the Jefferson administration. So so they're paying down debt. I mean it's it's very dramatic. They take in power here and they pay the debt down. Debt goes up a little bit because of the Louisiana purchase, but the debt gets paid off quite dramatically. And this is not as a share of GDP. This is this is the par value outstanding. Um, the debt gets paid off. What's interesting is that note that when they take office and they start paying this debt down, they start buying it back and paying it down, the value of the debt goes up quite, a, quite dramatically. They're actually, in many ways, the money men's best friend. Uh, the bondholders do quite well under, the, under, Je under uh, Jefferson and, uh, and Gallatin. They may not like the bondholders, but prices, bond prices rise, and they stay pretty. They stay relatively high during during uh, the Jefferson and, and uh, the early part of the Madison administration. That this uh, whoops, clear. Um, um, you know, they this this paying down the debt, running high taxes, cutting spending, running big surpluses, and buying back the debt causes bond prices to rise. And it's actually quite a, uh, you know, the moneyed men do quite well under the Republican administration, even though these, they don't, they rail against Jefferson and the, or, or against Hamilton and the Federalists for favoring these moneyed men. Yet in, there's a sense in which they, Jefferson and Madison, treat them, treat them better than Hamilton did, than Hamilton and the other Federalists did in terms of uh, supporting high bond prices there on these policies. And so you can see that the debt to GDP ratio continues to decline under Jefferson, but you'll see at the market value of the debt, the gap between the market value and the par value of the debt, the discount at which US debt trades narrows uh, during this period. Um, so you can, you can see it here, Here's, uh, this, is in the, that's the, this is the total quantity of debt. And again, you can see, you can see that the market value of the debt rises during, the, during that early part of the period and that this gap between the, between the market and par value uh, limits. Uh, that's another way to see it is if the ratio of the market value to the par value debt uh, is higher under the Jefferson administration than it ever was during, you know, when Hamilton was, was Treasury Secretary, uh, or particularly when Adams was, 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 was president and Wolcott was Treasury Secretary. Uh, this, uh, um, you know, it's still trading at a discount, but at a far less discount than, than under previous administrations. Okay. In 1811, the charter, the Jefferson's, uh, I'm sorry, Madison's in power, and uh, the Republicans are in power. Gallatin is, is uh, still Treasury Secretary. Uh, and the, the Bank of the United States charter is up. The bank, it needs to be renewed. The 20-year charter is, 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 needs to be renewed. And uh, the bank continues to be unpopular for the exact same reasons that the Republicans were opposed to initially. They argue it's not constitutional, no long-term loans to agriculture, monopoly power, foreign ownership. But now it's interesting. Gallatin now supports renewal of the charter. Now that he's been Treasury Secretary for a while, kind of likes having a, uh, a bank where he can get a, get a short-term loan. But the charter's not renewed in 1811. And uh, so the U.S. does not have a central bank. Further, now that since Congress had, had not granted Treasury any authority to issue, you know, small denomination, non-interest bearing notes that we think of as money, that's going to mean if the Bank of the United States can't issue money because it's no longer in existence, then the only bank notes circulating after 1811 will be those issued by uh, state chartered banks. And that's going to, so recall, this is where th we stand at 18, in 1811 with no central bank. With a, with a military that's been, been basically been defunded for the last decade, and we're going to start enter a war called the War of 1812, because it starts in 1812. Um, we'll take a break, and we'll talk about the, 
the uh, War of 1812 in, in, in 10 minutes. Okay, thanks a lot.